started since it's officially 9.30 and everybody's switched. So good morning. Uh, thank you guys for coming. First of all, it's super early and probably you were up way too late last night. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm Sarah. I'm going to talk a little bit about GIS for Python people. Um, I know it's a little hard to see the links on the slides, so at the end I'll just make sure you all have the link to the slides itself. So if you want to go to any of the resources that are in red, you can do so. Um, so I want to kick off with what is GIS, and first I'll, I'll preface that by saying that um, I work in programming, but I've spent many years working in GIS, so I sort of like work at an intersection of the two things, so I write Python and I make maps. Uh, so kicking off with what is GIS, <clears throat> technically if you attended uh, the GIS talk yesterday, you, you probably had a little bit of an intro to this as well. GIS is this big, monstrous, word that applies to a lot of things, uh, it means computer systems, infrastructure, software, industry, uh, people that do things with spatial data, blah, 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 then that makes you fall asleep. Uh, really, GIS is just anything related to data used to make maps. That's the simple explanation. You don't really need to worry too much beyond that. And here's a secret. Um, if you think I'm never going to do anything with GIS, that's probably not true because spatial isn't special. Spatial data is just regular data. It just happens to have location data attached to it as well. Um, one of the things that I want to be able to tell you today is that as a developer who doesn't really feel that you work in GIS or anything related to GIS, you don't really need to feel that GIS is something you won't work with or can't work with or is completely separate. If you work with data, which most of us do, then it's just another kind of data. So for example, say you have regular data. This is data that I pulled off of data.austintexas.gov. It's a list of fire stations in a particular district in the Austin city limits. Uh, they have names, they have jurisdiction names, locations, addresses. There's stuff that I cut off, but it's just a regular data table, like all sorts of data tables. So if you want to spatialize that, it's the same data. It just now has two columns for X and Y, and it has latitude and longitude coordinates, which is just uh, spatial data. It shows where those exist in space. Like, as people that use Google Maps to get directions, we can understand this. It's nothing, nothing crazy. So you can use spatial data like that that comes in a data table or some kind of format, and you can use it to make maps, and that's the basis of how maps are made. You have regular data, you attach a location to it, then you can throw it on a map. So that's great, but so what? As developers, why should we care? Well, if you have spatial stuff, data that has spatial information that can be attached to it or is attached to it, being able to mix that up with your everyday data munging is a great way to make your data more relatable, to make your finished product something that people can immediately think that they have some relation to. Uh, and plus, people like seeing maps. Maps are cool. But if you could just show people like not just what data products you're, you're producing, but also like where things are, how it applies to users and viewers, then that, that makes your data more interesting. And as far as uh, making your data more interesting, this doesn't need to be something that's not relevant to your industry. Like, there's a lot of uh, companies, like you can go talk to the Matt My Fitness guys, a lot of people doing non-primarily spatial work that use spatial data to make their finished product. Like, Matt My Fitness will tell you, like, we're not a GIS company, we don't do GIS stuff. But one of, like, a lot of their primary products are based on and tied to location data. So Matt My Fitness Twitter, Facebook, Google, all these people have a lot of people dedicated to working with spatial data and integrating that into their data products. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, talk a little bit about types of GIS data. Sorry. So I won't bore you too much with the types of GIS data stuff, but just so you get an idea of what's out there when you start looking for GIS data products that are ready made, basically it comes in two different flavors, vector data and raster data. And you probably are already familiar with the idea of vectors and rasters in general. Mostly if you're downloading GIS data from like the City of Austin website that I showed a minute ago or from some other public data source, you're probably going to be interested in vector data. But I'm still going to talk about rasters for a minute anyway. So real quick, raster, raster GIS. Raster data for GIS stores, stores information in pixel grids. So every single pixel, every single grid cell has a value. None is also a value. None is a it's an equivalent value or an equally important value as anything else. Uh, rasters in GIS can be useful for aerial imagery. Everybody knows about aerials on Google Maps. You turn on the background imagery. Uh, elevation models, this is a special kind of raster where every pixel has a value showing how high the ground is, the elevation in that area. The black areas in this case have none, which means there's no ground there. This is an island that I took a picture or grabbed a picture from the internet of, so there's no elevation around there because they didn't 
measure it. Or remote sensing, which is a completely entirely separate uh, discipline, but it's interesting and cool, and it's basically uh, bouncing light from satellites off of different parts of the Earth and then measure the, measuring the ref reflectivity, which tells you what's there. Is it a tree? Is it water? Is it buildings, et cetera? So raster GIS data is basically the same idea as regular digital images. Uh, it just has location data attached to it. So like the idea of an aerial image already makes sense to us. You just have some kind of digital bitmap, and you just attach location data to it. It becomes raster GIS data. So raster data is <clears throat> Raster GIS data is really good for representing information that uniformly covers a broad area, like that elevation. Like every point, every cell has a value because the information is the same, or the value is not the same, but the information can be measured for the entire area. It's not so good for representing stuff like fire stations where it doesn't uniformly cover the area. So for that, we use vector data. Vector data is just made up of points, lines, and polygons, which you're also probably familiar with in a geomet geometric sense. And the idea is very similar for GIS. So in the same way that geometric points are made up of an XY coordinate, uh, you just use a latitude, longitude, and it's now GIS vector data instead of just plain geometric vector data. So what is all this good for? So vector data, you could use it for points of interest like fire stations, that's how you would record that. Uh, you could use lines to record rivers or roads or boundary lines, um, lakes, building footprints, census areas, that's something you'd use a polygon for, that sort of thing. Um, and a lot more interesting stuff too, but this is uh, very common use cases. A lot of uh, public data portals will have this sort of data available for different areas like the city of Austin or the state of Texas will have this sort of data available to you. It's, it's a very easily obtainable public data set. So okay, now we know a little bit of what GIS data is. Uh, you can find it from different public portals like I talked about, and you get an idea of the difference between raster and vector. So what are you going to actually do with it? So say you go to City of Austin's GIS portal and you download the fire station's uh, points set. So what are you going to do with it? How do you look at it? So one thing you can do is use a software called QGIS, which Paige was talking about yesterday. Uh, were any of you in her talk yesterday? Few of you, okay. It's the same software suite that she was talking about. You can download it for free, it's open source, it's awesome. Uh, go find her slides if you weren't there to get information on QGIS. So using that to visualize the data after you acquire it is really nice because you wanna get a picture of what, you, what you've got. You wanna be able to vis visualize it before you start munging it with Python. So yeah, like I said, QGIS, free and open source, often offers a whole lot more than just previewing your data. You can do lots of analysis if you feel like it, but you don't have to. And yes, you can extend it with Python, which is what Paige was going to be talking about. So now that you've acquired your GIS data, uh, a little bit of information on how you want to store it. It's basically the same as any other data. You just have to add that spatial component. So but there's three main options for what you want to do for storing your data. Uh, use a database or serialize it or download something called a shapefile and then immediately change that into a different format because shapefiles are terrible. Uh, so option one, use a database. Usually relational, um, some people have played around with using like Mongo to stick spatial information in and that's cool but I don't know anything about it. Uh, but traditionally it's stored in uh, relational databases which is just regular, spa regular database and then to make it a spatial database you add spatial components which uh, basically you need to store the geometry which is the latitude, longitude coordinates alongside the attributes. Um, you need to be able to make spatial queries so say like find me all the pubs within one mile of me. That's, an, that's a spatial query. Uh, you need to be able to ask your database that sort of stuff. And then finally, a spatial database has spatial indexing, so those queries are optimized. So, sorry. What you'll want to use for this probably is PostGIS, which if you've worked with PostgreSQL is the same thing, but with spatial components. So it has that geometries and spatial queries and all that stuff that I was already telling you about. Um, Spatialite is also an option if you're using SQLite for stuff like development or uh, maybe like mobile or stuff. Spatialite is SQLite but with those same things, uh, but you're not going to obviously probably use it for production on the web or something. Um, I also say it's great for sharing data because as you know with SQLite it makes a single database file that you can just send to somebody. Um, you can also just serialize your data if you're working on the web, you, you, this might be an option that you want to do with your vector data, just turn it into a serialized data format. So just like regular data that you would use, like JSON. Uh, GeoJSON exists, it's a standard that takes coordinate data and pushes it into JSON in a standardized format and everybody can parse it. You can stick it on all sorts of uh, 
web mapping libraries, they all understand GeoJSON just fine, so you don't have to do any special work. You can play with it just like regular JSON in Python, of course, and you can write it just like regular JSON. If you prefer XML, although I don't know why you would, um, you can use KML, which is Google's XML flavor. It's good if you're like wanting to make data to integrate with Google products because they have like super good integration for KML. If you want to give somebody uh, information to throw into like Google Earth or something, they can they could like throw a KML file on it. And there's Python libraries for writing KML. I just haven't used them in a long time. Okay, but there's also shape files, like I said. Shape files do exist. They're actually the most common data format that you'll probably be able to get data in. Uh, if you've ever grabbed data from any public data portal, it probably came to you as a shape file. And this is a shape file. When you get a shape file, you get a lot of little files together. And that's what they call a shape file. Yeah. It's a pain to work with. All of these files have to go together when you're transferring your data. You should have to zip it up. And this is a single vector file. So it's usually not the most optimum way to work with data. Uh, on the one hand, because it's so old and common, it's supported by most like desktop software like QGIS. On the other hand, it's not really nice if you're building a web application to have all your data in shapefiles. But luckily for us, we, have, we use Python, and you can read and write shapefiles pretty easily in Python. Which brings us to talking about playing with the data, which is the fun stuff. So say you have shapefiles and you want to change them to something else, or you want to pull data out of them, and you don't want to think too much about it. I suggest you start with this library called PyShape, P-Y-S-H-P. Uh, pip install PyShape to get it. It's pure Python, which means it has no dependencies, which if you're in the GIS universe or trying to work with spatial data in Python, is a really nice thing, because there's a lot of good, good tools out there, but most of them have de dependencies that are kind of a pain to get going. Um, PyShape only reads shapefiles. That's all it does. And it lets you pull data out of them, write it into something like GeoJSON or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's really good if you're in a hurry, really good if you just want to pull data into Python objects without doing anything else. It is limited, obviously, because all it does is read shapefiles. You can't do anything else. But it's a really good way to get, st get started. But for everything else, the more complicated things. So I'm going to digress a minute. This is not Python. GDAL OGR is a C library, actually. Um, but it's everywhere. If you've ever worked with spatial data or read about spatial data, you might have used tools that were built on top of this. It's a huge library. It has all sorts of vector and raster GIS tools. It's free, it's open source, it does everything, and then it cooks you dinner because it re literally does everything related to spatial data. Um, but bad things about GDAL OGR, it can be a pain in the ass to install and configure it. Has anybody here ever tried to work with GDAL OGR? Was it easy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a pain to configure. Um, it's really good, but it's, it's just annoying. Um, the docs are a little bit overwhelming because it does so much and it's such an old library, there's a lot of cruft in there to sort through and it's a lot of jargon that you probably have no idea what it's talking about. And um, it does everything, but if you want to chain commands together with their like command line interface, it gets annoying. You start writing like a paragraph on your command line. And it does have native Python bindings, but they're not very Pythonic and they're kind of a pain to work with as well. So it's a good library, just don't use it as it's presented na natively. But the good news for us is we speak Python. Uh, we don't have to use their native libraries. Other people have made better tools. A lot of Python tools that exist are built on top of G.OGR. Not all are, but many good tools are. And that's a good thing because that tool set already does everything. It's a bad thing because it still has those dependencies and it's kind of a pain to set up. But once you get that set up once, you understand the process and you can use a whole bunch of tools. It opens up so many tools. So the first tool set I want to talk about is Fiona which pip install Fiona if you want to get it. This is uh, basically an interface to the OGR side of GDAL OGR. I should explain. GDAL OGR is a set of tools for raster and vector, like I said. GDAL, G-D-A-L, is the raster set of tools. OGR, OGR, is the vector set of tools. In the next version, they're apparently going to merge that together, but for now, you can think of GDAL as raster, OGR as vector. So this Fiona library, is an interface to the OGR side. So it's only for vector stuff, but like I said, you're probably mostly going to be working with vector anyway. It basically handles I.O. for spatial data, but not just shapefiles. In this case, you're not limited to only using shapefiles like the PyShape library. So this is nice if you get data in all sorts of weird formats or um, database formats even. It'll, it'll interpret database formats. You can read in data. It turns it into uh, easily usable Python objects. You can do basic actions on it, like on here I've got a so I've read in data with Fiona, and it turns data into what it calls a collection, just a, a group of Fiona Python objects. 
uh, the length of that collection is however many objects you have. So like pretend my awesome shape file was all the fire stations in Austin. And the length of that would be the number of fire stations because there's one point. Each point for a fire station is an object in the data set, if that makes sense. Um, you could see the feature. You can iterate over it. You can see uh, attributes on the features with Fiona. You can see basic stuff like uh, the projection, the type, the metadata that's attached to it, that sort of thing. And you can do stuff like it, it returns data automatically in JSON-ready strings. So you can JSON dumps some stuff, and you can push it directly into GeoJSON without even thinking about it. So like I said, it does every format, including shapefiles, uh, makes reading and writing basically any kind of GIS data that you get super easy. And if you do want to work with uh, rasters, there is a Rasterio data set, same author, it's just for the GDAL side. I haven't put examples here because I don't work with rasters very much, but from what I've read, it's just as easy and it's great. So if you find yourself wanting to mess with uh, satellite imagery or something, totally go with this. If you use NumPy and you're a NumPy side by sort of person, it has really good interop with that. So it, I don't know for sure what people use that for, but people like it because they like NumPy arrays. And um, I didn't talk too much on the last side about Fiona's command line interface, but it does have one called Fio that just shortcuts to a lot of things. And Restrio has one called Rio. So if you don't even want to build a full Python script, it has a nice little one-liner interface. So after you've done your I.O. and you have stuff in a format that you like and you're not really concerned about that sort of thing, uh, how do you have fun with the data? Like extract information out of it, manipulate it, and make new information. There's a library called Shapely that you can use to do this. And this, is, this does stuff like use it to make buffers around your area. So I have that fire station's point layer and I want to make a buffer around every point and see what's within one mile of every fire station. Like draw a one mile ring around every point. That's the sort of stuff you can do with Shapely. Uh, you can do all, fun geometry, uh, stuff like convex holes, unions, intersections, centroids. So like, uh, what's something you would want centroids of? Say you've got, yes? Suppose you've got a, a dozen ham radio operators that are coming to a meeting and you're trying to figure out the uh, best place to hold a meeting. So people have to drive the least distance. Yes. Centroids are pretty good. Centroids is totally a good way to do that. If you want to be crazy, you can also talk routing because you've got driving in there. And there's uh, tools that will do, based on road networks, optimal routing. But uh, then if you want to take into account stuff like speed limits and so on, that's a whole different ball of wax. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, yes, totally. Centroids is a way to start. Shapely will also help you with uh, routing and networks, like if you had road layer, so you want to Instead of drawing as the crow flies lines between people, you can actually follow the road layer, which is cool. Yeah, that's totally a good reason that you would want to use spatial data. Um, unions, intersections, that's fun if you want to see where uh, interactions and uh, relationships are between polygon shapes or line, line features and so on. And you can find differences. So this is really cool, finding a geometric difference. You have two polygons that are almost the same, and it'll show you the areas where they are the same and the areas where they differ. So like. The, uh, or the overlap and the gap and so on. So Shapely and Fiona can be used together. Shapely and Rasterio can also be used together. Like I said, I don't have examples because I don't really do raster stuff. But you can uh, chain together your I.O. with the Shapely doing the more complicated stuff and it's really easy to write applications and scripts that use both of them. So like in this example, I've uh, used Fiona to do the I.O. with the shape file again. Um, like I showed previously, it just it's a collection of Fiona objects. But then you can grab information out of it, uh, grab geometries out of it with Shapely. So this is kind of ugly because I was trying to make it all in one line so it fits on a slide. But Shapely will read geometries into ge uh, Shapely geometry objects that then have lots of uh, methods you can work on them. And so in this example, I've got like City of Austin Parks. It's a polygon file with all the park outlines in Austin. And you could uh, see the type of feature it is, so like polygon, line, point, et cetera. Curves are also supported, but that's a whole different thing, too. Uh, area, draw buffers around it. The buffer making feature is really, really fast and shapely, which is nice, because if you've worked with GIS data in a desktop, you know that um, it's like really slow to do. Uh, grab centroids, just like that. It's cool. What's drawing a buffer? What's drawing a buffer? Oh, so like if you have a point, or uh, this works on any feature. So a point line or a polygon, um, you want to expand its boundaries by an equal distance all the way around. So 
in this case, I'm using 10 units, which you can further specify what your unit is. I'm just using the native unit of the data set, and I'm using 10 and expanding it equally all the way around at 10. Yes? So does that mean that the point doesn't exist in that particular point, or does that mean that, for instance, labels and stuff will be drawn within that boundary? So basically, a point doesn't have an area. In this case, this is a polygon feature. So let's, I'll talk about polygons, and then I'll answer about points, just because it's confusing. Um, so this has made the same polygon, but expanded it by 10, say 10 feet, all the way around its boundary. If you have a point that doesn't already have an area, it essentially creates a polygon for you with the centroid where your point is and then expand it equally all the way around. So it's a circle. Actually, any more questions while I have this slide up? Okay. What's that? The same thing I can't see, but these Oh. Oh, okay, okay. Very nice. Uh, and just more to hammer home about uh, centroids and buffers and so on. So in this particular instance, I made a buffer and then I found the centroid. The centroid could change after you make a buffer around a polygon because polygons aren't generally circles, unless they're circles. But if it's a point and you put a buffer around it, the centroid is still your original point location. Are those points the uh, latitude longitude? Yes. They're just really, really, really accurate, supposedly. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's shapely uses a bunch of decimal places. But yeah. More questions? Okay. So here's a bunch of useful online tools. It's not Python related at all. Um, these are really great to make you not have to worry about this boring GIS stuff that people do all day. Uh, people have already made tools for you. GeoJSON.io is beautiful. If you go to it on your laptop now, you'll see you just paste in GeoJSON on the side and it'll automatically visualize it on a map, which helps you really quickly see if you've reversed your latitude, longitude, and your points are all in the middle of the ocean. Mapshaper.org. If you grab data from public data sets, a lot of times it's going to be super huge and complex because they like putting like like if you're drawing a polygon, they'll put a vertex like every two inches on the ground and we usually don't care about that kind of accuracy. So Map Shaker, Shaper will make that file size a lot smaller by simplifying those edges and taking away a lot of extra vertexes, or vertices. Um, and it's all drag and drop and it takes like all sorts of file types and it's fast, which is crazy. Geocodio, oh, so let's talk about what is geocoding real quick. I know I'm almost out of time. Geocoding is matching addresses on ground to latitude, longitude coordinates and vice versa. And there are services that will do this for you, so you don't have to think about it. Geocodio uses the U.S. Census data set, which is good because it's free, but it's also bad because it's only for U.S. Uh, MapQuest actually has a really good API that's based on OpenStreetMaps data set, so it's international. Um, some places, of course, better than others because OSM. Uh, they all have free tiers to start with, and then they go up at different pricing levels. You can check it out. Geocodio is easy to work with, but as Python developers, you're, you're fine working with crufty old API, so use MapQuest. That's the one I like. Uh, real quick, what do you do with your spatial data? You make maps for fun and profit, usually on the web. Option one, you want to do it all yourself? Use GeoDjango. You already know how to make a Django app. You add one line in your includes. You use a spatial database instead of a regular database. And then your app is magic because you've got maps in your GeoDjango admin, just like your Django admin has your regular data tables. It's awesome. It's regular Django. It just adds a spatial component. You can do spatial queries, spatial models, et cetera, et cetera. Um, option two, lazy or busy web developers. Make a GeoJSON file, push it to GitHub. That's it, there's a map. GitHub will render your GeoJSON file onto a map for you. You can embed it into other things and they host it for you, it's great. Um, that's, that's the easy way. Uh, TLDR of my talk here, spatial isn't special, you're a developer, you can handle data. Python makes all of this a lot easier than it would be otherwise. Maps are a great party trick, people like seeing data visualized. That's it, 26 minutes, okay. If you have any questions, and we don't have time right now, hit me up. If you can't see the links, I'll, I'll give you the address in person. Questions? Yeah. This is kind of a random question. That's cool. You said that you prefer the MapQuest API, and I don't know what changed with the Google Maps, but like something changed and it's not intuitive. Yeah, so. No problem. Good question. I actually debated talking about Google Maps at all. Um, so Google Maps is awesome, but it's awesome because they have the most, the best data set for US especially. Um, but if you use the Google API, you are tied to using their JavaScript front end for your maps. You must use it and you must use the Google base maps. And by using all three of those together, you're also tied to their usage and um, limitations. So you can't just use their API and build your GeoDjango app unless you're using Google's JavaScript API and Google's base maps. Yeah. And you have to pay the money. Uh, the GitHub and Geo, yeah. 
So like you just make your regular GeoJSON file with coordinates in it. You test it out in GeoJSON.io to make sure it looks good, and you push it up to a repo, and you link people to it. This is just a screenshot of one that's in my GitHub repo right now, so if you want to stalk me on GitHub, you can see it and click buttons and stuff. Yes? Oh, what does the Q mean? Or, um, a lot of this functionality is in QGIS because it'll just have like clicky button interfaces instead of being automatable and scriptable, but it's because they use the same backend, the GDLOGR stuff, for a lot of it, not all of it. More questions before they kick me off? Okay, cool.